This episode is sponsored by Tegas, the future of investment research. From the beginning, Tegas has been committed to creating efficiencies in the research process by making it easy to access the content that investors need to get differentiated insights. Today, they're taking it one step further by bundling qualitative content, quantitative data, and better automation and technology together in the same platform. Instead of piecing together data from fragmented sources, just log into Tegas to get expert research, company and industry specific metrics and KPIs, SEC filings, and more, all under the same license costs. You can even take a look at your work offline with an Excel add-in that updates almost any model with the latest financial data, keeping all your custom formatting intact. Tegas is the fastest way to learn about a public or private company and the only platform you'll need for fundamental research. To try it for free today, visit tegas.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. All right. Hello and welcome to the another, yet another value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, we mean a lot of you could rate, subscribe, review wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have on for, I think it's the third time, my friend, one of, definitely one of the people's favorite guests, Judd Arnold. Judd, how's it going? Uh, it's going great. Thanks for having me again. I just want to give everybody a warning. My daughter really wanted her stuffed animals in the background. It was a very big thing. So we are joined by a few. This is my investment team right here. I like it. I like it. Uh, where's the hat? I sent you a hat. I know I sent you a hat. Where's the hat? I sent you a pic. I posted a picture of me you wearing a hat. You did send a picture. Uh, That's right. I, That's right. I don't wear hats in, you know, indoors with a hat. You know, look, look at you. Oh, you've got a hat. I mean, yeah, like... You know, you've got to hit, like, I, my head's got to breathe, you know, it's, uh, my wife is big on me not wearing hats indoors as well. So you're, you're just adding fuel. To There's that actually fire. a Sopranos episode about this with Tony making the guy take his hat off at the restaurant when they're inside. So I'm, I'm siding with your wife here. That's, that's, that feels that's, very that's, Sopranos. Like the respect. I, I get you. Uh, well, unrelated before we get started today let me just remind everyone where i start every podcast quick disclaimer nothing on this podcast is investing advice please keep that in mind consult a financial advisor do your own work uh you know somebody add, made fun i of have me. to add my my disclaimer too which is good please read the memo with for the full disclaimer some or all the securities we discuss may or may not be suitable for you investing contains risk of loss do not make an investment decision before consulting a consultant an investment advisor Everything we say may or may not be true. Please take it with a grain of salt and verify it. This is for discussion purposes only, and none of this is investment advice. And if you lose money, it's not my fault. Talk to you later. <laughs> it, might be the, it might be the stuffed animal's fault. It's perfect. Great, great disclaimer. So, look, the reason we're hopping on is because you published a novella on yeah. mixed power. Power Fleet about two weeks ago. We wanted to do the podcast right when it came out, but I, I was a little tied up, so we couldn't. You were saying, dude, we got to do it. We got to beat the sell side. People are going to start doing the math. You were right. The sell side came on, uh, but I'll include a link to the memo, to the novella in the show notes so people can go see it if they haven't seen already. But we wanted to do two things. A, go through the investment thesis, and B, we'll also discuss a lot of the feedback that you've gotten on it so people can kind of get in up to the moment, you know, what are how are people responding to and everything. So all that out the way, let's start. Mixed Power Fleet, the, tip, the tickers are M-I-X-T, P-W-F-L. They're going through a merger. Obviously, you think this is a really attractive story, so I'm going to toss it over to you. What is it and why is it so attractive? This, well, it's, it's, it's super attractive because you are buying something at the most fundamental level. You are buying an Internet of Things company, which, for those who don't know, I walked through in the, to your point, Novelica. It ended up being 98 pages, which is a little crazy but we'll get into why i write long memos as well in ports why i'm i'm going longer i mean uh the guy last year was 72 pages and anyway um this is an internet of things company that got a new management team two years ago the guy came from private equity he ran a few he had senior operating roles both president and like a very senior role that wasn't ceo for a francisco partners deal a goldman sachs merchant banking partners deal and i think i want to say kkr too anyway a real what i would call a real guy and if you're listening and not watching i'm, I'm doing my air quotes for real guy um brought in an entirely new management team as well and with a situation that was a struggle this is i'm talking legacy power fleet they did a I certainly say disastrous, but like a, the the nature of the merger and specifically the financing, which came from Avery Partners, which we'll get into as well. It was a bad merger that like the stock was 
you know, in the dumps and real covenant issue and you know, 17 times levered headline. Anyway, new management came in two years ago, has made a series of moves. This is what I would call the capstone that gives them the full product suite. And you create a business at one and a half times revenue. This is when I wrote the memo. The stock's up 50% already. So we'll, we'll say low twos. Um, and, you know, five and a half times EBITDA then. Now it's, you know, six and a half, seven times EBITDA now. But oh, nah, it's, it's like five and a half. Anyway, um, Versa Comp Samsara, which is the ticker's IOT. And this is really confusing. This is like the only time I'll write a memo where I don't use the ticker of something. So we're writing about IOT and Samsara's ticker is IOT. So from now on, I'm just going to, when I say IOT, I mean Internet of Things for this conversation. And if I'm talking Samsara, I'll say Samsara. Samsara has been a Wall Street darling. It, it is a darling. It is the fastest business that I know of. They, 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 they say this to get to a billion dollars of AR. And we're talking about an Internet of Things. These are all the devices, tracking and whatnot that go on vehicles, other things. It's a massive subscription business. Tons of recurring revenue. Samsara trades at 15 times revenue. You are buying this thing again at one and a half to two times revenue. And the question that the memo dives into is, is this now merged upstart agglomeration? Is it a comp? Is it credible? And man, if it is, I said $6 a share was the target, which is really like eight times EBITDA. If you really want what I, we did put in there, management thinks this could be worth five to eight times revenue, which would get you to 13 to $21 a share stock. When we put the memo, it was about three. It's about... 450, 460 as we record this right now, um, you can get to very, very big numbers. And you're also part of a massively growing TAM. It's at least 75 billion and it's growing. And we walked through this in the memo and we'll, I'm sure we'll dive into this. The big thing about this, and this is gonna be a recurring thing. And a lot of people ask me how I found this, why did I think this was interesting? And I'll start right here. I've done work and I've lost money in IoT. The ticker was K-O-R-E. Core, it was a D spec. I lost a little. All the promise of Internet of Things. And I've looked at Internet of Things on and off, everybody has for 10 years. And it started as what I would call a scrote industry or just like a, a garbage thing where it's gimmicky, product based. Oh, we have a sensor on your tires and they tell you if your tire pressure is low. These were all ARPUs of like two to three dollars and just crap. What Samsara and the private, the number two in the industry is Geotap. What they did is instead of starting as an amalgamation of products, they started as the whole encompassing system, providing an enterprise solution to customers, which are the companies that said, we're going to unify all of these disparate devices and we're going to be able to deliver to you suggestions on business process improvement. Contemporaneously, the insurance companies and the regulators look at this and says, Wow, I can do ESG, you know, compliance monitoring and tracking. What are your carbon emissions? What's this? What's that? And for insurance companies, it's, hey, I'll give you a fleet insurance product for all your drivers of trucks, but I want to know that you're only going 55 miles an hour and we can use this stuff to track. What I'm getting to, just to come back to the that, that point, though, this was a gimmicky industry, very low, R, very low ARPUs that was delivering ROIs to the cu their, their customers, the companies that were very low. Oh, great. You tell me my tire pressure. Uh, I'm not going to pay a lot. This doesn't move the needle. Once you integrate it all into a system and you deliver business process improvements, the realized ROI to the customer, the companies, goes vertical. And your ability to drive ARPU goes up a lot. It's a step function change. And we'll, we'll talk about this as we keep going, which is technological innovation is omnipresent and will keep going. ARPUs should go down over time because the cost of devices should go down. The difficulty in delivering them should go down. And the differentiation between different IoT companies should decrease over time. But what's happening, and if you're listening, you, you just have to like imagine my hands. We had ARPUs start high. 10, 15 years ago and gravitate to zero as the products themselves became commoditized. The difference between all of them was very low and the delivered ROIs were low. Now, if you think about a graph, we step function very high on our pools. There was big differentiation between Samsara, Geotab and PowerFleet. And I'm arguing that the differentiation between those three isn't so big that PowerFleet can't get what the other guys are getting. And maybe there's other people that can do that.
But those are those ROIs are massive today, and the ARPUs are step functioning up. And then over time, those should come down. So you have to grow your company by deploying more and penetrating that TAM. Talked about a lot there. We can unpack a lot. That, that's a fantastic overview. So I, I've got so many things to ask, but let me start with this. I think part of what you're going at is, hey, I, I love when you say my target is eight times EBITDA, six times uh, $6 stock price, the best comp trades for 10 times revenue, right? I love when your EBITDA target is below the, the peer revenue target. But I think a big part of this story is combining Powerfleet with Mix, right? I don't think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you would have been as interested in Powerfleet if they weren't going through this merger. And I love that for two reasons. A, I love big merger stories because I think they're one of the last places where an investor can go and do a lot of work and say, yes, I believe this merger creates value. I can put this on because guess what? Quants can't really go buy a merger, pl- uh, buy a like transform into merger play because there's no numbers out there for them to put on it. It's like on you as an analyst to do the work and say, yes, I believe these synergies. I think the synergies could be higher. But what I'm trying to ask is, A, talk to me about the merger story and why Powerfleet pl- plus mixed is like, I think what really attracted you here. And then there are actually a lot of places I'll go from there. But why don't we start with that? Powerfleet without this merger was a dead company. Mix without this merger, dead company. Okay. Samsara and Geotab are running the table because they have a unified product offering that has all, all the devices you need and a overlay with software, which is really the key thing to unify it all and deliver that business process and process improvement potential and to do all the compliance and insurance monitoring at the same time. Okay. Before this deal, Powerfleet by itself, Let's leave the balance sheet issues out, and that's a huge part of this too for Powerfleet. But in terms of product offering, the ability to offer it, they did not have the full product suite. What they really were missing in the breakthrough product of all the devices that Samsara has and Geotab has is the AI-powered in-cab camera that allows for monitoring. So what these cameras do, and we put, we put some examples in the memo, and you can Google and look online. It's one, you can, there is not enough compliance people in the world to monitor a full fleet of truck drivers. So an in-cap camera that faces both out and in, what it's doing is it's looking at the inward, which is in many ways more important than the outward. The outward just tracks. You get in an accident, it records everything and whatnot. The inward is more important, I would argue, because it's staring at the driver. If the driver is using his cell phone, that AI powered thing sends a warning to the driver. You're using a cell phone. If you're not wearing a seatbelt, it sends a warning. You are not. It logs it too, and it alerts the compliance people internally at the corporate HQ. Oh, he's distracted or she's distracted. Um, and that so that AI allows this to scale massively at very high incremental margins. Because otherwise, like if you just had in-cap camera without AI, some a human has to look at all this stuff in real time. And even without AI, it's still useful. Like this is more Uber consumer, that, but it's useful in an Uber, right? Because it shows like if there's a dispute, you're my Uber driver, we drive somewhere, there's a dispute. You've got the camera, you can show it to the police. You know, it still yes. would be useful without because you could go to the police in an accident and say, hey, here's the here's the video. My driver wasn't distracted, so you shouldn't hit him with reckless. But as you said, with the AI, all of a sudden it's, hey, pay a couple bucks per month per user and you're going to save $500 per month on insurance because the insurance company knows that your drivers are no longer distracted. They're not causing catastrophic injuries. Like that is the type of return on investment. It's it's the win-win that you're it's looking for. It's just massive. I mean, these companies are earning across all their devices, $10 ARPUs. Like that's how, now the full in-cab suite is like a lot higher. I think it's about 60 to 70 bucks, but like still to your point, um, you know, a big piece of power fleet is warehouse forklifts. It's like a big part of their legacy business. The average forklift safety incident is cost $50,000. So would you pay, you know, a thousand dollars a year to reduce your forklift, you know, per forklift to reduce the probability of a forklift accident truck, obviously a lot higher. And again, it's not just, would you do it so much of the demand for IoT is coming top down or pushed down from both regulators in terms of compliance monitoring and safety and OSHA stuff, 
as well as the insurance companies that insure all this stuff. They're saying, no, we're just not insuring you unless you have it because you see massive reductions in all these safety incidents. So going back to the merger, one is it fills out the product suite. Two, it, the business product suites are incredibly complimentary. Legacy Powerfully, I'm going to ex exclude the connected vehicle thing that uh, Powerfully does, which they picked up from the pointer acquisition for 2019, because it's not completely homogenous. It's important, don't get me wrong, but the, most of the folks in the memo was their core product offering, which is in warehouse, container. Um, so most forklifts use Powerfully. It's not a super competitive <laughs> Uh, smart piece of the market, which is nice. The returns are a little bit better. Um, they also do containers, both uh, cold storage and non-cold storage. So you think about like a warehouse logistics thing. You add in the mixed T cap uh, in cab camera. Now you have the forklift, the container, and the truck. You got all three. You're unified. It's a full use case. And so the cross sell between the two, and this is where GeoTab and Samsara were taking a lot of share, which is it's not just Powerfleet and Mixed T before this merger, but there's all these legacy IoT companies that started as quote unquote product companies where it was the founder came up, he or she came up with a unique device that was gimmicky, never was able to expand around it, and just had one off devices here and there. Samsara and Geotab said, we're going to go the other way. We're going to deliver a full platform and a closed architecture system to integrate all this stuff. It won't be up to the company to do that. We're going to do that for you. All right. Should, now with Powerfleet Mix, my argument essentially is this unification of these products gets them to enough scale plus the software overlay that we'll get to, which is called Unity, uh, that they have to unify all of those and third-party devices, makes it so, wow, you guys can do everything. So bidding on RFPs, depending on the company and whatnot, they all of a sudden, there's you know both companies said, well, hey, I can do two out of three requirements and whatnot. These guys can now fulfill for most RFPs the full suite of requirements as well. So it gets them to that critical thing. Next thing this merger does, you had two subscale companies. When, what I mean by subscale, I mean in, the, in this sense, I mean the, in the financial sense, which is all businesses have a fixed amount of corporate overhead. That's just table stakes, corporate GNA, Salesforce, and all the other stuff. You need enough gross profit to finance that powerfully zero EBITDA, right on that cash burn level. Mixed tea, same thing. The merger plus the synergies that come with this, which they said was 25 million bucks, I think the real number is 45. All of a sudden, you get the pro forma company massively free cash flow positive and able to sell fund, which is really important because Samsara and Geotap investing a ton in R&D and investing a ton of sales. So all of that. And then lastly, for Powerfleet specifically, this disastrous merger they did in 2019 with this horrific uh, fight that they got, this convertible preferred note that had exploding interest rate that all of a sudden five years out starts going from 7.5% a year to 17% a year, anti-dilution protections, all this restrictive stuff. Basically, I sum it all up with, you were 17 times lever with a gun to your head and you were about to die if you were powerfully. And the impact that has on the organization, you couldn't really issue equity because it was the anti-dilution would kick in with the preferred and then all this other stuff. Mixed tea, yeah, totally on lever business. Their issue was listed a South African, <laughs> you can't make this up, South African company that had a US ADS. And I don't know what the difference between an ADS and an ADR is. And, but uh, I don't it's even also... I, I just assume it's all the same. They list in the U.S., still still had the Johannesburg ticker in 2013. They switched from IFRS to GAP in 2019. And the management team just said it again and again through all the calls, and they said it at the investor day. The number one piece of investor feedback they got was nobody cares because we're not in an index and we're in ADS security. So you look at the holders list. They had a guy who worked for Warren Buffett for seven years, um and started his own fund and like very value heavy what i would call like deep vic guys like uh value that's value investor clubs for people that don't know people who are like very focused on low p multiple that's the whole shareholder list pretty illiquid. I, 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 feel, I feel very seen right now judd I'm yeah very seen. but but with mix it's just to complete the point mix the best thing for power fleet was mix was essentially all equity finance and so this deal is a massively massive deleveraging transaction for Powerfleet, which is 
You go from 17 and a half times lever, 17 times lever to 1.5 times lever overnight. And you get rid of the app where you prefer. So you go from a cash poor management team to, you know, all of a sudden cash generative, tons of balance sheet capacity to finance more deals. It is when you, this is why, if this isn't a transformational deal, I don't know what is a transformational deal. This episode is sponsored by Tegas, the future of investment research. From the beginning, Tegas has been committed to creating efficiencies in the research process by making it easy to access the content that investors need to get differentiated insights. Today, they're taking it one step further by bundling qualitative content, quantitative data, and better automation and technology together in the same platform. Instead of piecing together data from fragmented sources, just log into Tegas to get expert research, company and industry specific metrics and KPIs, SEC filings, and more, all under the same license costs. You can even take a look at your work offline with an Excel add-in that updates almost any model with the latest financial data, keeping all your custom formatting intact. Tegas is the fastest way to learn about a public or private company and the only platform you'll need for fundamental research. To try it for free today, visit tegas.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. Let me, let me provide my first like real piece of pushback here, right? So you yep. got Mix merging with Powerfleet. And as you said, both these companies have been known in the value investor community, right? Like I remember Powerfleet when they did the pointer acquisition. I remember people who were long pointer. Mixed, I've known people who were long them for years on this thesis. Hey, you're paying a value, exactly what you said. You're paying a very low value multiple for a for an internet of things company. This is you're probably paying too cheap for the business, and you might catch fire and catch a multiple. Uh, I know a lot of people were pretty frustrated with the management team on and off at times. I, I believe Samir Patel actually came on this podcast when he was frustrated with them and talked about a lot of the frustrations and said this has the potential to be a really good business. So I guess my first piece of pushback would be you take these businesses that are subscale, struggling, maybe not executing perfectly, right? You mash them together. And I do hear you on the synergies, but hey, we're competing against, you know, these things, it t they tend to scale really well, but we're competing against two scaled players who are already together. By the time we mash these together, start realizing the synergies and everything, aren't we just so far behind the leaders? Like I, I kind of think of, cool, if you're the fourth largest player in internet, search, uh, cloud services, that's cool, but like you're just getting out scaled, outpaced, and you, you kind of fall far behind. Does all that make sense? It does. And this is a huge point. And, I, and like a lot of people have asked how I found this. And th this is sort of the key, key point. And yeah, well, I'm now I'm going to say, cause everybody sees me pausing. So I, I was trying to come up with a, a, a metaphor for this. I guess I, a lot, I share ideas with a lot of people. And obviously as my online presence has grown, more people show me stuff because they want me to write a big memo and publish it because I perform. If everything's going to perform like powerfully after you, I'm going to start showing you all my ideas. Beg you to so, go on the podcast and pitch them. I get a lot of stuff. And my progression on this was I have a background where I spent seven, eight years on a merger art desk. And the, the initial reason why I, my filter of should I spend any time on this or just no was reverse merger index implications, but they're being added. They're probably going to be added to the Russell. Um, and the person who pitched it to me, all they had was it's a reverse merger. They're going to get added to the Russell. And here's the math. It's five and a half well, times EBITDA. Well, there was also people were worried about the financing for a while. And I think Mix was trading for a 25% discount to the Powerfleet stock. Now there were borrow implications, everything. But th that was also yeah. a kind of attractive one. But too. like I saw there was a 20% merger arb spread. Yep, the exactly. person who pitched it to me, who's brilliant, by the way, even they didn't, they didn't really have a ton of conviction either. They were like, hey, this is interesting. And me, the, the initial piece of interest to me was, wow, it's a 20% merger arm spread. Why? Oh, it's a reverse merger. And right, and me understanding reverse mergers and merger arm. So in a reverse merger, there are more shares looking to be armed than there are shares available to short against them. So let's just do the math. Powerfully standalone is 37 million shares. The pro forma share count is going to be 108. I put 115 in the memo I had for the uh, MIP and like the, the management count, but let's just talk static, okay? 37 million powerfully shares before the deal. The mixed T guys are getting 71 million shares in the pro forma. So the pro forma is 108. So in a theoretical max ARB situation, 
you have people with 71 million shares looking to short and hedge out to capture that 20% arm spread against 37. You can't. There isn't enough. That's why the spread is 20%. Um, because the ARBs themselves can't drive it. What else happens in these reverse merger situations, and this just comes from experience, which is the ARB pressure is inordinately higher than it would be in a normal merger. So most mergers, there's a standard trade that I used to do, which is late in the merger, the ARBs are really pressuring it, and you can buy the deal if you like the pro forma, and the deal's gonna close and the, the, the selling pressure is gonna go away. You can usually make 10 to 20% coming out of an ARB deal if you buy it at the right price, at the maximum pressure from ARBs. In a reverse merger, it's even greater. We put it in the memo. It's up to 50% of the volume has been ARBing. And so you think about that release and, you know, that's going to come. And so our two nearest term catalysts that we were like most bullish on was one is going to get added to the Russell. Why? Because power fleet, 37 million shares is going to 108 times the share price of three, all of a sudden 300 million. That's going, that's for sure making it to the Russell. Now, as we talk today, it's, you know, almost 500 million bucks. It's for sure going, it's going to S&P, baby. <laughs> Plus the merger or pressure goes away. Plus I'm paying five and a half times EBITDA. And that's kind of my response to almost every negative about this thing, by the way, is I'm paying five and a half times EBITDA. I don't even care that the comps are 15 times revenue. I'm paying five and a half times its price then. Anyway, that was the initial reason to go deeper. When I got a little deep, the core investment question in my view was, I was going to name the report, is this just a lie we tell ourselves in Microsoft Excel? That was, that was the flashing red light, which is... Everybody can, on a spreadsheet, you can't tell the difference between Citigroup, investment bankers, Morgan Stanley investment bankers, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. If you live in the real world, you know there's a difference between those places. It doesn't show up in the Excel, okay? Every industry, you know, Coke and Pepsi, Coke versus RC Cola. You know, we can take RC Cola, we can merge it with five other things and we can make it look really pretty in a spreadsheet. We can do that little lie like, oh, if they just get 1% more market share, we're going to make 20x. That's not the question. The question was, I needed the diligence, two main points. How sticky are these customers? Number one. And two is what is the nature of competition? So the customer stickiness was big, and you can see it financially as well, which is people just don't switch. These devices have a five to seven year average life. Switching is really painful because if you're doing a truck fleet, you got to bring all the trucks in. You probably are only installing them in one location. Otherwise, you have to deploy a tech team all over the place. So now you have to reposition a lot of assets. If you have devices, they're like, man, you got to put a new device on before the device is old. One I other start question... On the switching yeah. costs, one quick question. I agree with you. Like this is well known in a lot of things, right? If you've got a, if you've got a little tiny thing at attached to a thousand trucks and that's producing data, it's really sticky because you have to go take a little tiny thing off a thousand trucks. It, could I just on AI? Does the AI piece actually increase stickiness? Because I could imagine, hey, we've had an AI piece in you know a thousand trucks for two years, right? Studying the data and its feed. And when Judd, when his eyes go down, it's because he's looking at a cell phone, right? I could imagine not only is it difficult in terms of costs to go and replace all those, but also you need to train the AI up for two months to re-recognize that on the new system. Because if you replaced me as the IoT provider here, I would not give you all the data, right? Generally, the provider owns the data. I could imagine that. However, I could also imagine you say, no, you, you've kind of trained it up on a prior data state. So just wondering, does it's the AI not that, it actually but it, Yeah, it's not that, but it's related. Well, I quickly figured out this was a minimalist standard as opposed to a maximalist. And the, what I mean is you talk to these IT directors and they're like, the difference between all these companies in terms of what I actually need delivered is very small. There's a lot of bells and whistles you get with Samsara and Geotab that you just don't need. And so I put in like, is this a Lexus versus a Toyota Camry? You can use all these things. I also I like put the, in. Can you give an example of a bells and whistle that Samsara might provide that you don't need? And I did like the Lexus Toyota Camry example in the memo. I, I, I think of it more like the other example I put in, which is like as Castle versus Bloomberg I, iOS versus Aladdin versus Bespoke. Like when I was at Citadel, like it was immaculate. The trading the trading system that you could use and all the risk systems it was so easy to use, so intuitive and whatnot. I went to Newberg and Berman, my fund, we didn't have that. We, we got Bloomberg off the shelf. Not that there's anything wrong with Bloomberg, but we also tested out Alice Castle, just buggy. And like there were 
All the things that I could do on the Citadel system, I wish I had. Did I need them? No. And, you know, a lot of stuff on, I mean, think about Bloomberg. A lot of the stuff on there, you just don't use. I had to switch when I left hedge funds from Bloomberg to uh, Refinitiv Icon. I miss my Bloomberg, but I can't sit here and tell you that, like, I'm still not making money with Icon, you know? And so it was really more, they do enough. Enough people said all of them have their own issues in terms of install and the bugginess and whatnot. And it's less what you're talking about retraining them. It's the IT guy said, you have to think about it way bigger than IoT. They're like, I'm running Salesforce. I'm running this enterprise application, this. Stack on top of that all the IoT. Every IoT device I've ever run because these things are little, they're little cheap plastic boxes, okay? Let's let like let's talk about the actual device. These are little cheap pieces of garbage, okay? Yes, the, the camera's really nice, but I gotta guarantee you, five years from now, those cameras are gonna be like three dollar items. I thought I thought about them a lot like flat screen TVs, where like I had this awesome Samsung Blu-ray when I was like a young hedge fund buck in like 06, 07, then cost me five thousand bucks. I I have a Samsung curve now. It's better than like what I ever had. And, you know, it's a $200 TV. So technology increases. My point was, most people don't, it's not even like the difference between the bells and whistles. Most people aren't going to use all the bells and whistles. In terms of what you use, it's really the software interface that helps drive the business process improvement, which is the ability to track drivers and be like, okay, this guy habitually gets better miles per gallon on this route. Let's go back to the game tape. Like, and that's really what IoT allows. It's like game tape coaching for everybody. All right. Hey, everybody. Joe is driving really well. He's 20 cents per mile cheaper than all of you. Here's what he's doing. And here's what you guys have to do. And so, though, and that comes from the software overlay. So, powerfully started developing Unity a long time, uh, two years ago. Two years ago, they, they did this awesome acquisition, which I put in there called Moving Dots, which they got the entire IoT division from Swiss Re, 40 data scientists. They got paid 8 million euros to take them off Swiss Re's hands, which is crazy, really up their game. They got unity to a place. So the difference between what I realized from talking to tech directors, the difference between isn't enough that they care. These guys can compete on price, and they did say they're cheaper. And I've gotten data points from other people, like, it's cheaper. The other huge thing is Geotab and Samsara are closed infrastructure. They're like Apple, where um, Powerfully is open air architecture. Where that matters, I had it reversed, which is I was like, would I take an iPhone or an Android as if I'm making like a de novo decision? What I learned from talking to these tech directors is like, their thought process is I already have all these disparate devices, and even if my IoT, is all the same. I still have to integrate it with my Salesforce, with my other enterprise apps and whatnot. I'm, I'm going to have this problem. And then like at most asset intensive industries like trucking, forklifts, and all the other stuff, you do m and Okay, we just bought another truck. Are we really going to add a $500 cost to like really upgrade everyone? Are we going to, wouldn't it be nice if we could just accept it and just integrate it into our system already? They're dealing with a least bad alternative as opposed to an ability to like get perfection to begin with which I'll just wrap it all up into this to me all went with this. The IOT industry is massively fragmented. Semsar is like five, 6%, maybe. Geotab's not that big. Some of it's geographic, some of it's product, all the other stuff. Is there a place for this, this being power fleet mix? And is the TAM growing? And whether, and if I'm wrong on a place for this, I'm going to be right on the TAM. And if I'm wrong on the TAM, there's probably a place or what I really think is going on is I'm right. There's a there's a pro, there's a product market fit for this. The other two guys aren't doing this. I've got an awesome CEO who is just laser focused on delivering this. That was his, what the vision he set set out to do. He's now executing it, and we're part of a growing tech, and we're paying five and a half times even top for this. We're gonna go to the CEO in a second because I really do want to talk. But just one question that jumped to me as you were saying it. Right, you said, hey. Samsara and GTAP, they are both closed systems, and this is open system, and you argued for why open system is better, which actually makes a ton of sense to me, right? As you said, you're trucking, you have 200 trucks, you do an M&A, you get 50 trucks, like you'd rather just be able to put them on no matter what system they're on. That makes sense. However, you also talked about the two largest people who are trading at 10 times revenue, growing like weed. They're running closed system, and they appear to be winning. So 
why are they winning with a closed system and like powerfully obviously going open? It seems to make sense, but it's also different than the larger guys. So like, why is that the right move when it seems like people are naturally gravitating towards the closed? I don't know if, so I don't agree with the way that you phrase it, which is they're okay. gravitating. They're gravitating. I think you have a sea of customers and for some of them open is going to make more sense. Certainly where my diligence was focused was with powerfully starting in forklifts and trucking. Does this work? And in talking to tech directors there, it seemed like, yeah, these guys have 300 million bucks of revenue of which product based revenue is like, you know, uh, about 50, 60 million. So you're talking 250 of ARR. And then I go through in the memo. Some of these are like the legacy business mix is actually not great. And this is a little bit of play on an improving business mix. The true like TAM applicable, applicable, uh, TAM applicable ARR. So the ARR that they have that looks like the rest of the TAM is probably 125 to 150 million of a $75 billion TAM. Can this thing get to a billion of ARR? That was the question. Like if this, if these guys get to 600 million of ARR, like we're hitting a 10 ball on this stock. <laughs> so there, I think, you know, going through Samsara, you know, which is, look, the other reason this was interesting to me, I followed Samsara since they went public and it's like, this is su super interesting, but Samsara has got like talks about some of their customers. They have six of the top 10 airlines. If you're an airline, I totally get why this is closed loop. You're probably starting to know though, in terms of like, you don't have sophisticated devices on any airplanes. You know, because you think about the legacy IOT stuff, which is like tire pressure gauges on like earth moving equipment, that stuff's not going on planes. We need a technological improvement to get to the point where like they can add value to like air freight. Okay. Can mixed heat power fleet compete there? No. On a like a totally global multinational asset heavy, you know, $2 million ARR type customer. I would suspect Geotab and Samsara are going to win in that bigger market. I would point out, though, half of their ARR for Samsara, they disclose it, is guys who pay under 100000 a year ARR. And that was sort of my, my thought, which is like, fine, we'll give these guys. And I don't even know if that's true, by the way, like that those guys are better. I just was able to determine and get conviction that there was certainly a viable place there was a path to probably get to a billion of ARR, and that was me, enough for me. Let's go to management, right? So management, I want to talk about the, the there was a prior management team, uh, powerfully, powerfully management teams taking over. I want to get your thoughts on everything. Uh, you you mentioned the management comp package in your memo. I, I want to talk about that. And I, I have some other things that, that management has said, particularly at the investor day, I want to get your thoughts on. But why don't you just talk to me about the, the management? I think the business. most important thing for me with management, or one of the most, I shouldn't say the most, one of the most, I have it in the memo, the chairman of the board in the 2002 investor day introducing the new CEO. And he gives this whole long thing. And at the start, you, you, it's in the memo and you can find it obviously on Tegas or wherever, if you look at it, it's the 2022 investor day. And he says, we wanted to bring in somebody who is a software guy and not a product guy. And, you know, I thought about that a lot and I'll go back to core for a moment. Core and all the legacy IoT stuff, but Sam Saro was so gimmicky to me. Oh, I can do this little thing. I have this like one business process that I have stuff for. Like core at one point, the CEO was raving about this like remote control airplane that could like, it was like a radio flyer basically that could take vaccine pills through oh, Africa. And this, it would make back, the SPAC days were glorious. They yeah, were like, glorious. It was done. like, it was like, I called the guy up. I was like, Hey, what do you make on this? He goes, Oh, it's $3 a month. ARPU. And I go, why are you even talking about this? You think about like the problem with the legacy IOT guys is they were appealing to literally every use case. And one of the legacy power fleet ones was, Oh, we have a deal with Avis where we can like unlock the car doors and it works across all car models for when you're renting, you just show up and you have to talk to a person. All right, great. So now I do it, install a new sales force that understands all of these products can sell them all. All of them have like this limited TAM. They're all like very discrete use cases where you go to like what Samsara does in Geotab, their, show, their whole sales force is showing up. We do a unified enterprise encompassing solution for everything. And that's where PowerFleet's going. 
And that's how you leverage the IoT. I mean, it was kind of to me like I was thinking about the salespeople when I was at Newburger and we, we, we raised money for a hedge fund. We're going. And like, I asked a few of those salespeople, I go, what do you even do? How do you do it? And they're like, why? I go, you have a menu of like 50 different funds that you theoretically could sell to an allocator. How do you pick which ones? Like, there's no way you know all this stuff. It's too much. And they're like, you're right. I just pick one or two that like are working right now. And that they're like, I can't sell all. So my point just being, it's like a triple negative to have a quote unquote product approach in IoT, which is you're like scale stinks. You can't like your R and D is really high because you have all these disparate small low markets. Your sales force doesn't know what to do, and your customers are lost. You're always spending all this money in R and D, and it's like this is just like crazy. What new management did allude to me was, and I, this is coming from me, not from them. They're actually incredibly polite with British accents. Well, the CEO. Oh, this the start of the uh, the I think it was the merger. They come out and they say, "Look, I know you have not what you express. I'm um, this, I'm this, I'm this, and I'm British." And I it, it made me laugh. It didn't. Yeah, me laugh. but they kind of said, and this is what why, why I was going to the chairman. They're like the old guy was really excited. Like he came from Qualcomm. He was just very into products, and that's what Samsara and Genotab do different. And that's what Steve Steve's the CEO of Powerfleet that came two years ago. Steve came with this vision of it's the software, not the product. And that's really, that insight is the most important thing. And everything he's done, starting with Moving Dots, which is getting, you know, the data science group out of Swiss Re that does IoT, it building Unity, this unified solution, and his device agnostic approach. That was what he saw coming back. He's like, there's room for this. I need to, deli I need to deliver it. He believed in product market fit. Now, what's nice, I thought this was going to take two or three quarters to prove out where I was going to say, like, it's coming, it's coming. The Q4 earnings from Powerfleet, man, you know, 9.5% organic growth, 16.5% growth in the United States where Unity is most deployed. Like, you have product market fit. Now, the 16.5% growth in the United States with Unity, and they're beating out, like, they're at Walmart, they're at all these, like, reputable places, right? They're beating out Samsara and Geotab. Look, Samsara is still growing at 50%. Like, this is, there's an element here of, yeah, again, this is the bull case. Like, set, you know, for me, I go back to like Zoetis and Alonco, where like these are animal health companies that, you know, Alon, uh, sorry, Zoetis trades at like 32 times earnings, and Alon has had five or six activists. It's got another one right now trying to close this gap, and it's at 14 I, times. I, I'm laughing because I, I know the Alon. I know the yeah, Alon. and like Alonco's more lever and whatnot. But I like in the back of my mind, when I was like starting to scale this up, I was like, you know, I would love for Powerfleet to be a long coat. Just traded a 50% discount. <laughs> like, that's pretty, that's pretty good. So anyway, so, oh, wait, back to management and the comp. They also, so they came when the stock was five bucks. Um, they really don't get paid until 15 bucks a share. I have heard, and we have told the board. You said and 15, management. not 50, just because it, it was One a little five. too yeah. Well, that, I, yeah. I knew from the memo. I just wanted to make sure because I no think problem. the listeners might've heard 50 and been like, Oh, Oh, no problem. What? I, look, I told the book, you know, we wrote a note to the board and um, we told management as well. Obviously, it's self serving for them. Like, we would feel a lot more comfortable if there was new management comp laid out because, um, as part of this, that's more realistic. One, because I think they should get paid. Two, I don't think the board or the management team fully appreciated the situation that they were in when those guys joined two years ago. Like, they knew they were in trouble and they made a change. But this Avery preferred just literally nuked the company and it became existential and it drove the stock. Yeah. You know, right before this, the merger was announced, Powerfleet was at two and a half bucks. And I'm yes, looking yes. at this thing and I'm like, you know, you really can't fault management, new management at this point in time. This is, they joined at the start of 2022. It's mid 2023 when they table this deal or I should say October 23, the stock's down 50%. And I mean, they've done everything right. And so I, I think there is a case to like get new comp. But anyway, um, it's more than just Steve. He brought a new CFO, chief product officer, merger integration. Op like it's a great team. We put a bunch of the bios in there. We think this thing can scale. Let me just on management. So we talked about incentives. I, I do agree. And the other thing, the other reason is, you know, if you bring in team in and as you said it's not like this is discovery where you've had the same warner brothers discovery where you've had the same ceo in there for 12 years and he's just done 
one value destructive deal after another and the stocks gone down like you brought a new team in and they had this disastrous preferred which it's so funny i know of like four or five companies that did the similar preferreds with intro lever deal interest rate have to pay off 50 percent in five years and they think oh we'll grow into it and all of them have choked on the uh all of them have choked on the preferreds but in this case what i'm trying to say is it wasn't management's fault right they had this awful preferred thought maybe we could grow out of it and they're kind of choking on it could i just say something before we move on from this yeah, point yeah. I put the meme in there from Hunt for Red October. I saw about it. you, you arrogant, you know, ours, you, you killed us. I negotiated some of these preferreds. I, when I was in distress, that de distressed debt hedge funds, like we did, you know, I did a few, I did one into DHT, um, holding the shipping company back in the day. And I've done other ones. I, for the life of me, don't understand why Avery or anyone would want these terms. They made all their downside scenarios like manifest into awful. And it's like, it's not even belts and suspenders. It's like, I want belt suspenders and a parachute. And, you know, at some point, like you have to like set up a company to succeed. And one and a half, like the finance is still, they get a one and a half at one and a half X pref right out of the gate. They have this ticking time bomb interest. They have anti-dilution. So it's like you're senior and you're protected on the downside on the strike. Like, why would you even do that? And then I'm also at the same time, like it's on the, it's on the, it's on the, it's on the prior it's management team though. Like the prior yes. management team's the one so that's the other I would take that, that deal all day. You look at the deal background. This is like I, mean, I can't remember the last time I looked at a deal background on like a prior deal. So I get the pro the merger S4. Uh, from the point of view from 2019, because I was like, how did this even happen? Like what? And the merger background was they tried to do a stock for stock merger with Pointer. This is the, the 2019 deal in 2018. The deal died. The lawyer told them, they're like, you should call Avery. This was like spring 2019. Six months, they negotiated this deal. Then with that money, the, the CEO, after getting just like dragged over six, I, I don't understand how this thing could even take six months. Like you have two weeks to come up with these answers in the world I live in. Anyway, then he goes and he pays 10 times a fake EBITDA number for Pointer. Oh, completely overpays. And the guy's, you know, Israeli seller and everybody knows my history. Well, maybe you don't know my history with, with Pagaya, but, and I'm also Jewish. I always have to make that caveat when I'm saying something. Uh, but, I'm glad, I'm glad you hated on the Israelis for five, five minutes and then let everyone know you are Jewish. So you, you have earned that right. I, and, so, and I live there. I, and I think I, I, it is the subset of Israelis that you deal with in public markets is just universally the worst. It's so bad. Because they're brilliant, but they're amoral. And I can just like picture like what happened. This like sucker, I'm going to say sucker of a CEO at Powerfleet gets rejected on a merger of equals, go gets dragged over the coals by Avery with his preferred, shows up with this insane financing, says, hey, I'll buy you out now to the pointer guys. And the pointer guy says, sure, I'm at 12. Give me 18, you know? And the guy takes it. Like, you, you just... Anyway, like the CEO and like the pro forma, they, they asked for for that. They missed it by, I mean, not even a country mile. They missed it by like 15 nautical miles. Plus like, I don't, I mean, just atro atrocious. Let me Sorry. bring it back to the present day, the new management team. I mean, look, I'm not as close to the name as you are. I, I've followed the names Lucy for a while. I read most, not having completely gotten through both of the the merger presentation and the investor, but most of it. And I guess the one thing that jumped out to me, and this might be because I've been looking at some companies that uh, let's be generous and call them more promotional recently, but the the management team did say one thing that jumped out to me. Where, where is it in my notes? He said, he talked openly about, Hey, we think we're a rule of 40 company. We think we deserve a five to eight times revenue multiple, right? And obviously you're saying in a Super Bowl case, they can hit the they can hit the kind of peer multiples and get there. And makes sense. But at the same time, it worries me a little bit to hear a management team talking about that. And again, it might be because I've been looking at more promotional companies. But when I hear that, it always makes me put a pause like, hey, you're trading at five times EBITDA and you're talking about here's how we're going to get to five times revenue. Does that worry make any sense to you or any concerns there? 
I don't think they're promotional. And I, and I get what, look, you and I, and I, maybe more me than you, like deal on this like tightrope of like, uh, it's a little, you know, most stuff I, you know, I, I pitch, you know, if I three, four X or I strike out, you know, and I try to get out of my strikeouts, you know, with, with, you know, my wallet, you know, Pagaya, we got out of there. We made a little bit of money. Kano, I, I lost a little bit, you know, but like that's sort of my game is get out of those. But this, I'll tell you, the CEO, I'm just more and more impressed with, with every interaction, number one. Um, number two, the quality of this asset in terms of investor interest level, I have never gotten this level of interest on a member. And my clients, like, I just to, I'll do a brief aside and I'll bring it back. I was really concerned when I left Wall Street, like, how do I stay in a loop of things? And part of my consulting business, what I was trying to do is not, is sort of curate a client list, which obviously I, I'm happy they, they, they pay me for my ideas, but everybody sort of has a role too, where like, I've got like the people from different backgrounds and I get a lot of feedback when I pitch them ideas, no different than you would if you've worked for a few different PMs where you're like, oh, this would work with that person. This would work with that person. Yep. And this is one where like, and you can see sort of, you know, you can see it in the stock action where this thing was trading, um, you know, the complex powerfully plus mixed tea in active merger name was trading one and a half million dollars a day ADV. You know, since the, since the memo, we're up to like 10 to 15 million bucks ADV. Uh, now part of that is that we highlighted it's a Russell thing and other people initiated, but like, I would just say like people care, you know, Pagaya, like, so I would, that's what I would say sort of obliquely to your thing. The other thing, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. The other thing I would say is it's, I, I, on this exact point, I was always a little skeptical of Celebrite, which is another SPAC name Israeli and it's worked incredibly well. I was involved and I gave up. Um, where I don't know if it was management, but it was like every sell side guy was getting it for management about rule of 40 or rule of 40. And it's played out that way. It took a while, uh, but it has played out and people have bought into that. But that was more specky and the other stuff. This, like, I'll tell you what promotional would be to me. Like, I would be skeptical if they're like, Samsara is at 15 times revenue and we're worth 15. Like these guys are reasonably putting like a academically and intellectually justifiable. Here's the numbers. Here's the grid. We kind of look like these guys. We have a subscription based business. If we execute, it would be odd, you know, if we don't trade, you know, mixed tea, you, you can read what the CEO said. And there was one, the best conference actually for the mixed tea CEO. It fell off all my screens because it was just a webcast with no transcript. It was in December at this growth conference. And after 30 days, they killed it. But I, I, he, he just kept reiterating, like, I tried for 15 years to get people to care. And no one cared. My number one feedback I got from people was, you're a South African, illiquid, random, you know, ADS ticker. And so I would just say, like, taken in totality... Like, I think they're, they're being quite reasonable with it. And I think it's a fair intellectual. Ultimately, the market will decide. And I think they've done the important things, at least I hope so, to allow that to happen. And from our target, again, like, we bought this thing at, you know, one and a half times revenue, 5.5 times even. That's kind of like my response. Like, if I was an investment committee, in the back of the memo, I have, you know, a, a rhetorical theoretical investment committee thing. Basically, my response to every negative is, well, you're not paying anything for this thing anyway. So... You know, it's better than the response when uh, you hear Bitcoin people and you put put them anything. They're like, "Hey, might go to infinity, might not. 50 50 shot. Who knows? Just it's you're not paying not- too much." Uh, let me ask. Memo's gone out. Tons of interest in it. I can tell because I'm on Twitter. I said you were coming on. I, I've seen the replies. What's obviously most of the feedback? I think you can see in the stock price, and you think you can see in the su- replies has been pretty positive. But what have been some of the more like? some of the more thoughtful pushbacks and not in the sense of, you know, lighting the thesis on fire, but the places where people have asked questions that you thought that's a really good point. That's really good. But I need to think more on that. It, it was exactly what I expected, um, which is, you know, look, it, you like to write a memo where like you can answer every question and you, you, you've given it as fulsome. So the key negatives, and we, we walked through this pretty much at length, the memo, the present day business mix of both of these is not great. 
they're both, they both have a big franchise business uh, component. What I mean by a franchise business, which is premium economics, something that you really can't expand beyond where it is. It's a little niche. So with Legacy Power Fleet, they have this Israel business that they got from Pointer, which is like all the public buses, all the ambulances, all the police cars in Israel. It's awesome. They earn premium ROEs. Can you really expand? With Mixed Tea, they've got this South African car location B2C business, and obviously there's a lot of crime in Africa. Um, and, you know, th there's like two other players in the market, but like they are an awesome ROEs for like car location, which is just nuts. I mean, that's like a very like, I mean, we could do like Lojack came out in 1995. That's what, that's what it is. It's Lojack. Um, and so that was like question. That was like a big thing. And our argument in the memo is one, you're, you're paying for a franchise business. You're not paying for a good one. And M and A is going to solve this, which leads to problem number two and pushback number two, which is what sh this is a role. They're going to buy more stuff. They've said they're going to buy 90 million bucks of EBITDA in the United States um in europe which oh now i have to set back em it's emerging market lots of fx risk is a, is another pushback that's obvious are people okay. really that concerned with fx risk it's not that they're concerned it's just like on a multiple revenue basis samsara is pro predominantly us and it's going to expand outside of us it's just you look at like the decomp and i have it of like quarterly revenue change like the change in FX, now granted, it's been a very noisy last three years with the Fed and with COVID and all this other stuff, but like, there's some big FX moves that can dwarf. Yeah, I, I guess, just especially for a grower, I, I would just kind of be like, you know, FX kind of evens out in the end, and yeah, if FX goes against us 5%, okay, we lose 5%, but it might go for us 5%. I don't, I'm surprised there was that much yeah. pushback on FX. I, it was more like, it's worth it, you know, is that a half a turn or a turn? Like, there, there's some level of discount, okay? Um then the, it's a roll up, all right, which sort of goes into this whole, what, what I was getting into earlier, which is, is this just a lie we tell ourselves in Excel? And this was really for me where I said, you know, and I think a lot of this was solved with the Q4 print because it was just so strong for Legacy Power Fleet. I thought we were going to be sitting there for two or three quarters where I'm like, yeah, I'm betting on certain synergies for now. The synergies are so big, but you're not going to see top line growth and you're not going to see positive forward motion on customer acquisition. And it's sort of like you could stay in the same place. I thought merger close and getting rid of short interest, shorting, plus the IWM ad, the Russell 2000 ad, would offset that. But I totally would take that like an investment committee. Every smart guy and girl I've worked for, like I put it at length in the, the investment committee thing. Like, yeah, I know. I might be wrong on time. And there might be a better place to buy. But I think I'm, I'm hanging my hat on the Russell thing and deal close um, to offset that like we might just be early in a role and we but, might oh go no go, go, go. The last because this is this is where the rubber meets the road like i think i said six because i thought you could six as, a, as like an out of the gate target because i'm just like look what i really say in investment committee is i hear everything you guys are saying they're hitting 80 million of ebitda they you know they said 100 there's no way they're not hitting 80 in 2025 okay and if I do five times that, you know, that's 400 million bucks less 100 million in debt. Like, that's what we're paying. Like, at worst, we're buying this thing for five times 80. And like, what good, like, is there anything remotely, re like, that's like a, a newspaper printing business trades for five times. Like, come on, give me eight, man. Give me eight. Every turn is almost a buck a share. Like you can, like, you're just creating so much convexity and th th that's kind of it. But like to get the real right tail, they need multiple more quarters. If they show 15% growth, it's like game set match where we have a $20 stock. Um, I don't even think it's 10, but um, that's the question. Like you can sort of get six to eight probably just on the synergies, but you really, for the follow through, need to see top line growth. I was going to say you need to see it when I wrote the memo. Now I get to say you need to see it continue, which is like obviously much I, nicer. I, you know, just one I, one other thing on this. I was just going back through my notes again. Mixed in Powerfleet Powerful, have yeah. been in the value investor circles for a long time, and we've talked a lot about how Powerfleet did a bad acquisition in 2019, got the new CEO in 2022. You know, one thing that strikes me, and I think it's a little underplayed in even your memo. 
I don't think anybody was talking about the mixed team as like, as like the next the Jeff, Jeff Bezos, Bezos or anything. Song. So I do think there's also something to getting mixed inside of this power fleet business with hopefully an upgrade of the CEO. Like it's not that you're just improving one side. I, I you know, obviously the synergies are there and everything, but I, I think you're kind of uh, going to kind of unlock a little bit of growth and entrepreneurship at mixed this as well. Is, this, I didn't want to like really overdo this more out of a respectful point. It's a very thoughtful point that you, you make and it's, it's right. I, on purpose left it out of the memo. And I, I, what I would say is you have a founder CEO who has been there, I believe for 30 years. This is the guy who ran next to And the stock, and stock, is, wow. stock is sideways. He is as frustrated as anybody else. I think if you spoke to him or communicate with people around him, there is a lot of acknowledgement that the last few years, the desire and the energy level has been a little bit lower than needed there. And I think it is a testament to them. The hardest part of any merger is the social issues or one of the hard things. And kudos to this guy. You can read, you know, the, the explicit thing in the deal background is that Mix at the end of 2022 hired a banker and had an existential search for what the heck do we do? And they arrived at this. Part of that was also the Mix CEO saying, look, I'm mid sixties. I don't know if I have the heart for this. And I think it says a lot. He has told everyone under the sun, this is the mixed CEO, that he is holding his one and a half million shares. Um, and, and he's really bullish. But yes, there's a lot of upside from that. On the merger background, I did mean to ask you this when I was first preparing when we started planning this. I forgot it, but now I'll ask it. I read the merger background as well. And it's interesting you had that read because I was kind of reading it and I was like, I could almost read it as these two were like, the least popular people at the dance. And at the end, they were like the last two kind of up against the floor, uh, up against the, the uh, wall. And they finally decided to get together, you know, because like power fleet, they're concurrently looking for a pipe as they're structuring this deal. Mix gets told by a couple people, like they get pretty deep in talks with the party B and they get told, Hey, actually we don't want to merge with you guys. Would you guys just want to make a minority investment to them? And they're kind of doing talking to all these people. And then they just like kind of stick together. Did you get that sense or did you get a different sense? Um, I got a different one. I get where your point's coming from. Uh, I was just deeper in due diligence at that point, And I think I appreciated the strategic imperative of what was going on. And I took it more positively as, you know, it's like from the movie Margin Call where Told says, be first, be smarter, or cheat. And, you know, those are the only three ways to win. I took it as these are two of the strongest guys that are about to die. And let's be clear, everyone but Samsara and Geotab are about to die. Because Samsara and Geotab, like, figured out, like, unified system, the devices don't matter. It's all about the software overlay and unifying all the devices. And I put in this example in the memo about uh, CalAmp, um, which is, you know, a random, de you know, device stock that was at, I, I think, 300 split adjusted. It is now zero. All of these device, all of these companies, except for Samsara and Geotab, started out as single product companies that maybe added one or two more, but were existing, had a business model for this world where there was no unification of devices. And now that Samsara and Geotab are doing that, you either answer that or you're dead because device margins 10 years ago were 45, 50% gross margins. Where are device margins going to be in five years? They're going to be zero. Like the devices are going to be given away. It doesn't matter. There's no differentiation. We're going to convert to zero. It's all going to be with the software and the value added of unification, all of those. So I took it actually, you know, Steve shows up in 2022 with this vision of he could have worked in a million other private equity operating companies. And he said, no, I'm going for this. I have a view. Device agnostic, but unified strategy. And I'm going to be the quote unquote Android. And I'm going to, I, I can compete with these other two people. And I can take this shell of a public company. Um, I can take this, like, do seven offsuit and I can turn it into aces. Okay. And the mixed T guy, I think, was a little bit different. I think it was a guy who knew, didn't know what he was looking for, but knew what, if he saw it, he would know. And he did. And I think the, the proof in the pudding of that is him immediately going to, I'm ready to resign. And that's great, that's great. so, Everybody else, and this is part of the MA story, which is these two guys have merged. They're very complimentary. It solves everything. They, you know, they're talking about MA. I put it, you know, the math in there. The reason I think they can buy people out at two, three times EBITDA post synergy 
is they're like it's a hundred percent synergy buying a device and just adding it in adding into your thing it's like think about like salesforce you know or oracle just tucking in one of these companies that you know into their overall offering they can get rid of literally everything they can get rid of the sg <laughs> like all the sgna is gone the r d doesn't matter all of a sudden and like you can take you know you can pay up on gross profit it's you probably pay you know and you're gonna have tons of synergies. You plug it into your network and it's worth more as part of your network. This also sort of goes to the prior point that I was making and what I've got where some people, and this is why I put the meme in at the start, I think it's like page 10, where it's from um, Donnie Brasco, where um, they're with, with the strip club guy and he's got the Tiffany diamond and it's like, it's not, it's a Bugazi, it's a Bugazi. And my point was, it doesn't matter when like, people come at me and they're like, and I knew this was going to come. That's why I put it there where they're like, Samsara has a better camera. Geotab is a better AI in cap camera, or they have a better, you know, forklift monitoring device. I'm like, this doesn't matter guys. There's good enough. And after that, it doesn't matter. The guys just want a unified delivery thing. And as long as you meet requirements, you're fine. You don't need an F15 for everything. Like the best fighter plane in the world. Like you can use an F16. You can use, you know, some random like Soviet era thing, like because it's about the, the unified system. I'm glad you explained that because some of your uh, some of your memes make me realize how lacking I am in like my mid 90s meme game because I, I know exactly the one I just went and scrolled and found it. I looked at it, I was like, I don't understand. Like, what's Johnny Depp doing here? I don't get the so I'm but, glad. It, I'm yeah, glad I that's, that. that's the point, which is lefty can't tell what's real and what isn't. And the point of the meme is it doesn't matter. Stop focusing on the product. It's the whole delivered experience. This episode is sponsored by Tegas, the future of investment research. From the beginning, Tegas has been committed to creating efficiencies in the research process by making it easy to access the content that investors need to get differentiated insights. Today, they're taking it one step further by bundling qualitative content, quantitative data, and better automation and technology together in the same platform. Instead of piecing together data from fragmented sources, just log into Tegas to get expert research, company and industry specific metrics and KPIs, SEC filings, and more, all under the same license costs. You can even take a look at your work offline with an Excel add-in that updates almost any model with the latest financial data, keeping all your custom formatting intact. Tegas is the fastest way to learn about a public or private company, and the only platform you'll need for fundamental research. To try it for free today, visit tegus.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. I think we've done a nice job. I just want to go to one last thing, and I think this might be the, the most interesting point because I know a lot of people are just interested in your general model and everything, but one thing you've said, people are like, hey, why is Judd publishing these, I've been teasing you, these novella-length uh, papers, right? Pagaya, 70, 70 plus pages. This one, let's round it to 100 pages. Why is he publishing these long notes? And you've been saying, look, it's because I'm doing, I'll let you say, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Why are you publishing such long notes? Why have you found you getting so much value out of it? Liquidity equals victory. Every event-driven trade is about finding something before other people come in to buy it. You're hoping for, you know, in a factor expro expression, changes in trading activity. Can I find something that's really interesting to a broad universe? And they just don't know it yet. And when I was at Newberger, really, especially one of the big things I took out of that was seeing how long only really think and how they trade. Most of these mid cap, you know, small, me medium cap, mutual funds, and even the bigger ones. You know, these guys have, if you take out trading volume related to redemptions, inflows and outflows, this guy's a 10% annual turnover. They're putting in, you know, two new stocks a year and they're going to hold them for five years on average. And they do a ton of work in the beginning because they have to hold forever and they got to be right. And it's really much more, there's a big group of new burger called the Genesis fund. It's probably the best group. Well, it's a very good, there's a, a lot of groups at new burger are very, very good, but these guys, it's a $10 billion. It was 10. I, I don't know what it is now. Right. Then it was like a $10 billion IWM, you know, Russell 2000 was the benchmark. They delivered the Russell within like 10 or 20 basis points, the Russell total return with a beta of 0.8 to the Russell, just unbelievable alpha. And, you know, I look at the work that those guys did. I'm like, these are all private equity people. They like, they don't even need Bloomberg to like check stuff. Like they're buying it. And when you have that approach, you have to do a lot of work. 
So what am I doing with a long memo, with a lot of primary research and whatnot? I'm spoon feeding them. I'm accelerating their process. At least I'm hoping to, right? And if I can do that, I mean, you sort of saw it the last few days where like volume and power fleets are really rampant. You know, we're up the plus mixed tea. And you just see it where you're like, there's got to be at least five or six funds that are, you know, four to five percent V whopping into this thing. They just don't care. It's also funny not to blow smoke up your butt, but like, you know, a couple of not Goldman's and stuff, but a couple of sell side firms have initiated on the combined power fleet mixed. And I think they might be taking many victory laps for, oh, the liquidity is way up. The stock's up on this. And I kind of look at them like, no, you guys are like pretty wrong. Judd put this out and Judd's got a pretty, pretty interesting track record of delivering some big, big moves or some good stock picks. And uh, I think it's people getting really excited about Judd's memo. And Judd's memo is also five times the length and goes into a lot more like kind of tactical things well, than written, all of these other look, things do. I, I, I write from a bias, you know, the, the, the feedback, I, I look, I appreciate all feedback and like, you know, these things take a while and there's a whole process to writing these and I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, everyone, I, I get a little better. We added the investment committee Q&A section here, which was like, you know, a new one. I think it, it, I've gotten reasonably good feedback about it and, and whatnot, but it's really, you know, the guy who pitched me this stock, actually, he goes, the best thing about your, your memo, he's like, you write it like a buy side. And it speaks, it's not from a sell side perspective and you're answering a lot. I'm like, you know, look, I, we, we take all compliments. Okay. I got a five and a half year old daughter. I got a life full of non compliments coming. Um, but I've got a five and a half month old daughter. So am I, she's not going to be complimenting me in a year or two. It's going to be mainly negative. I have that. To you, you, you don't have a daughter. You have a boss. That's what, <laughs> that's what they are. You, you, look, we all, we all work for somebody, but that look, that's the idea with the memos. The other thing, obviously, look, it's great. You know, it shows people I get my work. Look, if I don't write a 90 page memo, people know it's within me. It helps, you know, get more idea generation of it. A few more people reach out lately with ideas for me to look at. We're really excited about the next memo. It's also for me personally, look, it helps with conviction. I'm sitting here at great tell for me. It's not a bad screen. Does this work in a memo? Because a lot of stocks, look, there's a lot of stocks that work that I, I don't really have much to say about. Um, this was a super unique situation. And this is a setup that. Quite frankly, I don't think I'm going to see this quality of a setup in terms of entry multiple, lack of knowledge. I mean, you could go on Twitter before this. Every day I was checking and I'm like, literally no one is posting on NXT and Powerfully. Like, when does this happen where you have merger our pressure into an IWM ad, super low valuation with PE back management and, you know, and a comp at 15 times revenue. And I'm trying to get this thing to like seven or eight times EBITDA. Like, this just doesn't exist. Like, you're not going to run into a lot of these things. And so that really, look, I bought more options on this than I usually do, partially because I was, like, convinced that the options were, like, totally mispricing this. Um, so you can see which contracts I got. Like, the open interest on the next two. I, I don't know if we want to say too much more on options. I mean, just remember to consult a financial advisor. You consult an investment advisor. But anyway, don't touch the options now. I think that's that's well understood. But or anyway, options are super risky. You can lose all your money. Be careful. Listen to the disclaimer at the start. There we go. We 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 see why I as expected, we're, we're running a little long. I've got to run. I've got a kind of hard stop here. But Jed, uh, look, a Awesome. Really glad to have you on. Glad we got to address all of this. And then right at the end, you mentioned the next one. So listeners, I'm going to tell them they, they can be looking forward to another, hopefully another Judd appearance in the near future, because it sounds like you're working on something else interesting these days. Yeah, we are. We are. So I really appreciate you having me on. People are interested. I obviously look at part of this is a business for me too. love advising people on ideas. I try to come up with three to five big ideas a year. This is certainly one of them. I don't think I can. I don't have three power fleets in me a year. Um, and while I shouldn't be taking a victory lap already, I'm pretty, look, the thing's already up 50%. Like, Merger hasn't even closed though. Merger hasn't even closed. So Merger hasn't closed. So, um, happy to get, you know, happy to help people, you know, and, um, really appreciate all the positive and the negative feedback. We like it all. So if you're. If you're still like listening, link to Judd's uh, link to Judd's write up is going to be in the show notes as well as to his Twitter account, so you can go read that, follow him, everything. But Judd Arnold, thanks so much for coming on, and look forward to having you in the near future. Thank you so much. A quick disclaimer: nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.